We are live. And Well, we'll wait for a couple more people to join and what the hell? We will roll the tape. Hello, space fans, and welcome to Professor Britton's Wacky Universe. Okay, welcome back, friends. Astronomy 1010 is in effect. We got a late start today. Hello, Jace. Sorry for everything. <clears throat> I was having a, a difficult Monday, shall we say. But I'm here now, and I'm excited to continue talking to you guys about terrestrial geology. We're going to learn a little. I'm just trying to adjust my camera here for best effects. Maybe if I slide it like so, let me go like this. There we go. Are you all plugged in? Huh? I Are am plugged in. Yes. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> uh, the, I was the first thing I checked today. <clears throat> awesome. Um, okay. So uh, where were we last time? We were learning about impact cratering, right? So let's talk about impact cratering. Um, let's share screen for a moment. And uh, I don't think I have any general announcements, so let's look right at our, uh, our slideshow here for planetary geology. And let's take a look at a, a cratered surface like the moon. That's slide 83, but I want to come back to, um, excuse me, I want to come back to 42. Okay, 83 and 42. So this is a picture of the far side of the moon. It doesn't look very familiar to you the way the front side of the moon does, because this is the side that normally points away from Earth. And you'll notice it lacks as many of the maria. We have a couple of small maria here, those sort of flat volcanic patches. And it's mostly just riddled and pockmarked with crater after crater pig piled on top of each other. At what point in the solar system's history would much of this cratering been formed? That's something I'd expect you guys to have a vague idea about. Like early on. Yeah, like what's that called again? Early on. Why would it be uh, early on? Because that's when the solar system was forming. It was a little chaotic. Right, and we have a name for that. What's that? This is what I wanted you to say, Jay. So yes, you are correct. What's the what's the name of that that period called? Does anyone remember what he's talking about there? That's an important concept in solar system, in the history of the solar system. The early period of the history, or the early history of the solar system. Uh, <sighs> It has to do with the, the trips that the astronauts made to the moon. One of the questions that they wanted to know, is it slide 42 that I want now? Hold on. No. Let's poke around the moon here, and let's look at the front side of the moon. You'll, you'll remember that the Apollo astronauts landed in Tranquility Bay and Serenity Bay, which were these two smooth maria here. That makes sense. It might be a little terrifying to land your spacecraft at the edge of some crater where you might roll in and, and, and not be able to stand upright. That would be a little terrifying. But a question that people had is, why is there so much even uniform crater distribution along the so-called highlands, and yet the maria are smooth and relatively free of craters? That was a solar system mystery. 
And when they landed in the Maria, they took samples of the ages of the rock in the Maria, and they drove their dune buggies out to the highlands and took samples of the, of the highland rocks. And they found when they did a isotope analysis, when they, when they, uh, they used the process of radioactive decay to estimate how long it had been since the rocks cooled and formed, that the age of the rocks in the Maria was around 3.9 billion years old, but that the age of the highlands was closer to 4.6 billion years old. And they took the age of the lunar highlands as the beginning of our solar system, 4.6 billion years old. And that told them that there was a period of heavy impacting that we call the heavy bombardment period, where many, many meteorites were raining down onto the, or meteoroids were raining down onto the surface of the moon, creating these craters. And then a billion years later or so, some other geological activity happened, which basically must have repaved over certain sections with giant pools of lava. And that was a bit of a mystery. They knew that these maria had to have formed much later than the cratering. The fact that the Maria are 3.9 billion years old, and yet still today look relatively smooth, tells us that the rate of impact cratering in the early solar system was way, way crazier than the rate of impact cratering in the later solar system. Because these things have been sitting around for another 3 billion years, and they don't look anything like the highlands. This period, of course, is what's known as the heavy bombardment period. And that's the buzzword I was trying to get you guys to come up with. Uh, heavy bombardment is a period in our solar system's history where meteoroids rain down across the surfaces of the planets, creating these heavily impacted terrains. Um, they think it lasted, basically, they took the dates that they got from the lunar maria as their their dates there that the heavy bombardment would have occurred somewhere between 4.1 and 3.8 billion years ago after that most of the solar system got cleaned up the meteoroids either found targets to hit and smashed into them or they got flung out of the solar system or they ended up in the asteroid belt or the oort cloud something like that Okay, so what's the big takeaway? The big takeaway that we were supposed to learn from our discussion of impact cratering is that we can use impact cratering as a planetary science tool. And you'll remember the notes I was giving you last time said that when we look at the surface age of a planet, sorry guys, my, when we look at the surface age, of a terrestrial planet. Let me go to uh, speaker view and lock on myself. Uh, I've got a little bit of glare this morning, so hold on a second. That we can use the density of impacts as a measurement of the age of a planetary surface. So how did that logic run again? If I, see, if I see a high density of impacts, what does that tell me about the age of my planetary surface class? That's older? Yes, that it's older and maybe it's even related to the so-called heavy bombardment. If I see a low density of impacts, then I've got a much younger surface. If I see no craters, why then it must be super, super young. And you'll see that today in our lab when, oh boy, that, that word craters doesn't look very good. If it has no craters, It's a super young surface. And you're gonna see this uh, today 
when we look at the surface ages of uh, different parts of Mars, which is our laboratory for today. It's a, it's a fun one. Okay. So impact cratering is an important aspect of the solar systems or of planetary science that is not just cool because of the violence of the explosions and the impacts themselves, but also interesting because we, because we can use them as a tool to understand the histories of planetary surfaces. Now, you'll remember that impact cratering is one of our four geological processes. Uh, class, what were the four geological processes? Do you guys remember? We also have volcanism, plate tectonics, and erosion. That's right, and I want to cover some of those today. Um, so we've checked off cratering. Uh, now we want to consider volcanism. We want to consider tectonics. And we want to consider erosion. You'll remember that these four processes these four blanket uh, concepts are the different forces that shape and sculpt a planetary surface. And they come in varieties of different forms, so it's good to talk about each of them. Let's have a think about volcanism. That's our next topic. Volcanoes form when you have a thin lithosphere which is capable of forming cracks or vents. Either a crack, or sometimes you might even call them a vent, um, that allow warm uh, rock, in the form of magma um, to seep onto the surface of a planet. And there are a couple of different effects that, um, that volcanism has on a planetary surface. And I thought maybe we could try to sort of draw out a diagram or parts of a volcano Maybe I can show you one on the screen since I've got the ability to do that. So if we just check out the wiki page really quick on volcanism, sometimes I have students when we're in the class draw a little diagram of one of these volcanoes. Uh, there should be a wiki page. I think they have a cute little diagram. Yeah, this one here. <clears throat> so here's a little diagram. Uh, uh, of, of our volcano. Let's go over some more details so we can see the legend here. So down in slide one, we have something called a magma chamber. This is where warm convective rock is being pushed up through our lithosphere. Um, uh, slide two is the bedrock of the lithosphere, which is forming this crack or vent. And as the volcano erupts, it not only releases rock to the surface, which becomes temporarily liquefied, but it also emits a tremendous quantity of gas. And we call this part outgassing. That's very important. You'll notice that most of the, the magma is forced up the central vent, but there are sometimes these side vents, which develop side chambers. Um, there's a lot of technical geology terms that are quite frankly, uh, kind of outside the purview of this course. We kind of need to understand the basic concept of what volcanoes do to a planetary surface over time. In this case, the volcano has built up some kind of a dome. And two or three of the types of volcanism that we're gonna study have domes, and one type of volcanism does not have domes. Let's look at a couple of cute little pictures uh, of epic volcanoes. And I have some of those here in my PowerPoint slide, maybe around 43, oops. All right, something went wrong. Uh, let's start with a picture of the Cleveland volcano in slide 49. 
This picture was taken from the International Space Station and shows an eruption of the Cleveland volcano. Looks pretty epic. Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to start with this one was to remind the class that while we tend to think about the lava that comes from a volcano, it's also very important to think about the fact that volcanoes release tremendous quantities of gas. And the reason why outgassing is so important is because planets do not begin their lives with atmospheres ready formed on them. Planets, when they first form, are much too hot to hold on to any gases or keep any liquid water at the surface. But over time, if a planet has a thin lithosphere, volcanoes are constantly pushing out material that was once trapped underneath the bedrock, underneath the lithosphere of the planet, up into the, I guess, outer space environment surrounding, surrounding your planet. And eventually, billions of years of outgassing can result in a substantial atmosphere and even create enough surface pressure for liquid water to develop. So let's take some notes on that. Okay, so under the heading of volcanism, we're gonna discuss the uh, effects on a planet that volcanic eruptions have. So the first one that I'd like to mention is, um, well, we'll mention that lava, and lava is capable of repaving a planetary surface. That tends to make the, this is lava or volcanic outflows. These repavings of planetary surfaces make them appear young and smooth and new. The lava takes the form of a type of rock called basalt. Basalt is volcanic rock. we discover that much of the planetary surfaces in the terrestrial zone are covered in some type of basaltic rock. Basaltic rock is found on the surface of Mars, on Earth, and also on the Moon and Mercury, and uh, Venus for that matter, all the terrestrial planets. Um, lava also comes in different viscosities. Has anyone ever heard this term before? Anyone know what viscosity means in our class there? I just would really like someone to talk to me because I get so lonely here in quarantine. Like the runniness of a liquid? Yeah, yeah the runniness, the ability to flow, right? I like that. Okay, so it's the, let's just say the, the runniness. I like what Jake, uh, of, of liquid. And that's a, a Jace coined term there, but I, I like it. Okay, so for instance, um, soy sauce would be low viscosity and honey would be high viscosity. And the viscosity of your lava determines uh, basically what type of volcano will be produced when you, uh, when you have a volcanic eruption. And before I take any more notes, I wanna do a share screen on this because I've got some stuff to add. Let's take a look at some different types of lava. You know, if you were a, a, a geologist, boy, would you get into uh, the, the mineralogy of the different types of basaltic rock. This would be a big topic in your geology class. We're not gonna get into that level of granularity because this is a planetary science class, not necessarily a geology class. We've gotta save that for my more talented geology professors. Here's one picture of some uh, volcanic outflow. And you can see that the, the lava is so hot and so warm that it is literally glowing like a black body. That's thermal radiation right there. That's glowing because you're hot, just like coals in a fire. And this material was solid when it was underneath the Earth, but as it got closer and closer to the surface of Earth, the reduction in pressure makes this warm rock temporarily turn liquid. And it can flow sometimes for a short distance, sometimes for hundreds of miles before it, it solidifies. 
here's a picture of some lower viscosity lava, which has traveled uh, a much farther distance. You can just kind of tell that this, this lava was a little bit runnier and, and had a better ability to flow. This is sort of what basaltic rock looks like when it cools down. It's dark, it's black, like the surface of the moon or the surface of Venus or Mercury, dark black rock. And if you were to analyze its chemical composition like a geologist, you'd find that while many of the same minerals are there, the, the, the difference in the ratios of metals to rock contributes to how vis viscous the, the lava is. So Mount St. Helens is something called a stratovolcano. You'll notice that it has a greater percentage of silicon dioxide. That's what we call silicates in our class, and silicates are a stand-in for the word rock. But it also has a higher percentage of, uh, what is this, dialuminum trioxide? I don't know if there's a better way to say that. Um, but, but this dialuminum trioxide is, is a more metallic compound, and it appears in higher concentrations versus um, the Hawaiian volcanic islands, which are shield volcanoes, they have a lower viscosity lava, maybe because of the lower, uh, the metal content here. Although they have many more metals overall. It's a little bit confusing and complicated. And um, we can see one of three different types of volcanoes. We should probably take a note about this. Believe it or not, the lunar maria that you see are, are a type of volcano that does not form a dome because the lava is so low viscosity that it can flow too far before solidifying. So you'll see here that you can actually see where the flowing lava kind of cooled and came to rest. At one point, many billions of years ago, in fact, 3.8 or 3.9 billion years ago, if you looked up at the moon, this would have been a glowing sea of lava. And it probably persisted for many years before cooling down. Uh, we also see these epic shield volcanoes, which are named for the fact that they kind of look like a Viking shield. The shield volcanoes are both the tallest volcanoes, but also the most gently sloped. And of course, here you're seeing an image of the tallest volcano in the solar system, Olympus Mons, which is located on Mars. And lastly, we have the somewhat pointier, yet smaller stratovolcanoes. Each of these types of volcanism can be traced to the viscosity of the lava. So let's take a couple of quick notes about that. So we have volcanic plains. These are formed, uh, an example of which might be the lunar maria. And these are formed by low viscosity uh, lava. We have um, stratovolcanoes. Um, an example of this would be Olympus Mons. We'll get to look at that in our lab today. These are medium viscosity. lava and then we have oh sorry oh i'm sorry wow i just screwed that up guys that's last night's whiskey talking right there shield volcanoes <clears throat> did i spell shield right i have troubles with i's and e's class I'm not even sure I spelled it right there, so I'm not sure that matters. How's my spelling? I think it's the right that time. Okay, um, and lastly, we have stratovolcanoes. Sorry about that confusion there. Stratovolcanoes, an example of which would be Mount St. Helens, uh, 
these are caused by a sort of high viscosity lava. My black marker seems to be dying here, so let me try a couple others. All right, this one's a little bit better. Just taking a moment for you guys to write that down. Uh, at some point, I'd like to erase and move on from there. Just kind of looking around the faces here to see who's... Aaron, you gave me a thumbs up. I appreciate that. Jillian, how you doing? You gave me a thumbs up. Cool. All right, I'm going to erase unless anyone wants to shout out at me. So we talked about the lava. Let's take a moment to talk about outgassing as well. So maybe even more important for our study of planetary science is to talk about the outgassing associated with volcanism. Um, <clears throat> volcanoes produce planetary atmospheres. Early Earth would not have had the nitrogen-oxygen atmosphere it has today. Where we see planetary atmospheres, we almost always see volcanoes. The two go hand in hand. And planets can only maintain an atmosphere if they have active volcanism. So usually active volcanism is necessary to maintain an atmosphere. At some point, class, I'll be drifting onto the subject of planetary atmospheres, either today or more likely on Wednesday. And then we are going to get into the nitty gritty on those details. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, planetary atmospheres get lost over time. They're constantly leaking. An atmosphere is a leaky bag. It's always leaking away into space and it requires volcanoes to replenish it. What types of gases do volcanoes produce? Well, they're usually uh, a few of the same sets of gases that we see at all planets. The first one is H2O or water. Water is a primary volcanic gas and those big dark billowing clouds are full of it. They're also full of carbon dioxide or CO2. So water and CO2 are two of the primary um, volcanic gases. Also produce their nitrogen, some of the air that we breathe. Also produced uh, a molecule called sulfur dioxide. Sometimes pockets of methane and natural gas, but those are smaller. I'd say these are the primary volcanic outgassings. Sometimes you get elements like argon. These are in smaller quantities. Sometimes you get methane. Put a little clouds around the smaller ones. But across the solar system, water, CO2, nitrogen, sulfur dioxide, those are some of the biggest ones. Hell, you can see the colors from some of these gases. Even if you look at a beautiful picture like that of the, uh, the Mount St. Helens footage is insane. Yeah, if you have cool links of volcanoes to share with us, We'd love to see that, uh, Jace. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever seen, uh, I wanna show you uh, my screen here for a second. You know, the entire park of Yellowstone can be considered a type of volcanic plains. It's a big caldera. Oh, by the way, let's actually do uh, another diagram. I wanna teach you guys a, a new term here, a new vocabulary word that I'd like to use from time to time. At the top of a volcano, is a crater or an opening from which lava and gases spew. And this 
this opening here is called a caldera. Caldera is your new fancy term for a uh, volcanic crater. And this, of course, is called the dome of the volcano. Those could be good terms to have in your uh, in your speaking spell there. Cool. Um, I want to show you a picture from Yellowstone of something called the Grand Prismatic Springs. I don't know if you guys have ever heard about this. The Grand Prismatic Spring uh, at Yellowstone Park in Wyoming is so beautiful and you can see some of these primary colors that come from volcanic outgassing. Believe it or not, this, this is a real structure. People go and walk around it and check it out. Here it is from an aerial footage. Um, look how awesome this thing looks. The cent this is actually boiling water in the center. The steam and the boiling water are so hot that you would quickly be killed and overcome by poisonous vapors if you wander into it. People can actually walk up to this thing and look around it, and every year some dummy tries to walk into this thing and ends up hurting himself or dying. This happens a couple times a year. But all of those beautiful oranges and, and yellows you're seeing, that's probably sulfur dioxide compounds coming from the edge uh, of the lake. And we're going to see colors like this on several of the Jovian moons as well, which have active volcanism. But it's absolutely beautiful. And just showing you an example of how the Yellowstone uh, caldera is in some ways similar to the, uh, the, the volcanic maria of the moon. There are volcanoes that lack a dome because they have a very low viscosity lava. So, Jace, I don't know if you had a picture of, oh, oh, uh, wow, beautiful. Did you guys share a picture? Did I miss something? I'd like to see a picture of Mount St. Helens erupting. <laughs> I have a couple of different ones. The, the Pintabo uh, volcano in the Philippines is pretty crazy. The pictures of outgassing from this are just absolutely insane. So here's, here's one picture here showing a huge column of gas erupting up from the Pintavo volcano. There was a volcano that went off last year um, where people caught some footage of it from their boat and the sound of the uh, eruption was absolutely amazing. I wonder if I could find that. That might be... Uh, Volcanic eruption. I can't remember where it was now because it was over a year ago. New Zealand. Was it in New Zealand? Yeah, I believe it was. Um, let's thank you, Ernie. Let's see if I I believe there was a picture of some people on a boat and you could hear the thunder cracks of this thing. It's absolutely insane. We're following in New Zealand tourists Can you guys visited hear the an audio? active volcano. Some walking right into the crater. Many of them never made it out. People are an escape for your life. The volcano on White Island erupted several times while the tourists were there. Those Five people are confirmed dead. Eight people are still missing. There doesn't appear to be much hope of uh, uh, set. It could be. I was. I'm, well, I've been I'm visiting interested. that place for a while. Wow. I'm less interested yeah, in the tourist talking companies. Heads. I... All right, get out of here. Get it. Stop. I'm less interested in the talking heads and more interested in you guys just hearing uh, the the sound of the eruption. It was just absolutely epic. Um, it was it was mind blowingly loud. Oh God. Okay, forget about it. Um, I had a cool video of it last semester, but now enough time has gone, or my brain has gotten mushy, and I've I've forgotten. Um, in any case, outgassing is an incredibly important part of volcanism uh, because it helps maintain planetary atmospheres. Yes, there's a natural disaster element to volcanoes as well, but that's since most of the planets in our solar system don't seem to have life as far as we can tell, uh, life goes on after volcanoes. And in some sense, 
the, the volcanism is good for um, the growing of crops and plants as well because the volcanic soil is very rich. Um, I want to talk about one last thing associated with volcanoes before I move on. And that's the two different places on a planet or the two different methods by which they seem to be found. So let's, um, so there's like sort of two formation scenarios. Um, the first one is something called a convective hotspot. And we're going to kind of draw a picture of this here. This is where volcanoes tend to form at the same location on Earth, at places where underlying mantle convection, the bubbling of rock, tends to be stable. So somewhere, this is your lithosphere. And somewhere down here is your stenosphere, your mantle. I'm kind of mixing my modes here. And you'll have sort of uh, upwellings of warm convective rock. And they call this a convective upwelling. As convection pushes warm rock at the same spot on a planetary surface, it forms cracks and vents which lead to the development of a volcano. If a planet has plate tectonics and the plate gets pushed along this convective upwelling, you'll sometimes form a whole chain of volcanoes in a row caused by the plates moving over this convective hotspot. And probably the classic example of that, you'll have to forgive me, this is kind of a lousy slide, but I, I made it years ago, and I, or I found it years ago and I didn't really update it. But um, the Hawaiian archipelago is, is an example of a set of volcanoes, come on, that form over a convective hotspot. I should have a little crappy diagram of this somewhere. In fact, you can actually date the ages of the Hawaiian islands in millions of years and you'll discover that the further away from the main tallest island of, of Hawaii that you get, um, I guess Mauna Kea would be the primary volcano there, the, 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 the older and the shallower the volcanoes get. So I believe this red to green coloration is elevation, with the main island of Hawaii being the tallest, and then as you move along, them getting shallower and shallower, probably all the way out to, this doesn't show uh, Midway. Midway is probably one of the final Hawaiian islands or the oldest of them. But Midway has suffered so much erosion, the island of Midway, that it's basically just an atoll that's about to be consumed back into the sea again. So over time, as these volcanoes push away from the main island of Hawaii, they move off the convective hotspot. They are no longer an active volcano. And erosion begins the long, slow process. Actually, from a planetary science perspective, it's kind of a rapid process of deteriorating the island. Uh, I wonder if there's any other good pictures here of Midway. Oh, yeah. So look how far out Mid Midway is somewhe out here. And you can see there's a whole chain of islands that are being pushed along this volcanic hotspot. Today, the main island of Hawaii is still active, as we saw last year during those eruptions that sent side vents of magma spilling through people's backyards. But there's also a new volcanic island that's developing off the coast of, island, uh, of, of the main island of Hawaii. And I believe that's called Lohi. And Lohi is uh, the Lohi Seamount is still today an underwater region of active volcanism that is getting pushed along by plate tectonics. 
And as it moves over the main um, convective hotspot, it will begin building up to the point where it eventually pokes out of the sea and will become a new um, Hawaiian islands, probably in a few, uh, a few tens of millions of years. So here's a little picture of it growing under the ocean right now. So there's a deep connection between plate tectonics and volcanism that we're going to see in both of our formation scenarios. Obviously, we see volcanoes other places in the solar system besides Earth. And those places usually do not have plate tectonics. But on Earth, there's a kind of intricate connection between plate tectonics and uh, volcanic formation. In fact, if you think about it, many of the world's volcanoes are not scattered randomly across Earth, but they're located along the so-called ring of fire. Let's look at a quick picture or diagram of that. The ring of fire is a locus of active volcanism and plate tectonics that we see all over Earth. I don't know why this is, here we go. So much of the world's volcanism is not scattered randomly around the planet, <clears throat> but it's found along the Pacific Rim here, uh, or all along the edge of the Pacific Ocean. And these are where subduction zones or trenches are pushing parts of seafloor crust underneath the continents. And as the seafloor crust gets jammed underneath the continents, it forms a range of active volcanoes. You'll notice Hawaii is somewhere in the middle. That's the, the Hawaiian islands are convective hotspots. That's our first formation scenario. Our second formation scenario is even more intimately related to plate tectonics. It's places where convection is I'm sorry, uh, where, where plate tectonics is driving parts of the seafloor bed underneath continents and triggering waves of volcanoes. Japan, Indonesia, uh, along South America, all the way up to the coast of Alaska and the Aleutian Islands. And probably uh, a classic picture I have, let me see if I can remember which of my, yeah, here's the picture I'm looking for. This is a little model, we should probably try to recreate this slide 18 of how the process works. <clears throat> so you've got two types of crust on planet Earth. You have seafloor crust and you have continental crust. And there's a difference between the two. The seafloor crust is newer because it forms from underwater volcanism along mid-Atlantic ridges. Uh, it's newer, but it's also dense and heavy and mineral rich. The continental crust is much older, but it is lighter and of low density, and it sort of sits a little higher up uh, on the lithosphere. As plate tectonics drives the ocean seafloor crust towards the continents, the higher density, sea, higher density seafloor crust gets pushed underneath the continental crust in a process called the subduction zone. If you've ever heard about these deep sea trenches, like the... Um, <clears throat> Uh, what's the one that James Car uh, uh, Cameron dove his submersible into, like the Challenger Deep, or, or one of these uh, many underwater trenches, places where the ocean floor suddenly drops by several uh, kilometers down further into the belly of Earth. These are places where the seafloor crust is getting pushed down into the convective asthenosphere. Once this rock gets heated up, the, the lightest materials in the rock, which is usually trapped water and carbon dioxide, they get converted into a gaseous form and they can heat up the surrounding rock. Just think of it like hot steam that's billowing against this rock to the point where it melts rock and it sort of sets off a whole bunch of volcanism along the coasts of the continents. This is our second formation scenario. It's along subduction zones. And here we can draw a picture of the seafloor crust getting pushed underneath the continental crust and the C4 crust creating heat, which triggers underwater volcanism from uh, CO2 
and H2O. You'll remember those are two of our primary gases. On Earth, there's a deep connection between plate tectonics and the triggering of volcanoes. They go hand in hand. Okay, that's what I have to say about volcanoes for now. Uh, any questions before I move on to plate tectonics? For some reason, these topics, even though I don't cover, I don't feel like I cover them in much depth. They seem to take up almost an entire class time. I'm moving quite a long, uh, rapidly along here. <clears throat> okay, let's take a little peek at plate tectonics next. It would be cool if we could talk about plate tectonics and erosion, because then we can kind of put them all together and we can see how they work on the surface of Mars in our lab today. So I'm gonna cover uh, plate tectonics, not in any great depth, but we're just gonna talk about the basic concept. Um, and the concept is that plate tectonics is driven by a so-called uh, conveyor belt model. And the underlying mantle or the asthenosphere has these, as we've mentioned before, convection cells. And convection cells sort of push the, the crusty lithosphere along in various directions. And, 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 and basically, the lithosphere gets thinned out to the point where it fractures and forms a set of plates. As these plates get pushed along on the conveyor belt by convection cells, they smash into one another. And of course, the smashing of uh, lithospheric plates creates earthquakes. Earthquakes are the sort of primary natural disaster that results from active plate tectonics. But it's, it's hard to uh, underemphasize just how important plate tectonics is for shaping the surface of our planet Earth. You guys will remember in your last class, I showed you a picture of the surface of Earth versus Venus and Mars. And I can show that to you once again, just in case you forgot. But the primary difference you'll remember in the surfaces of these planets is you can really see Earth's continents popping out at you, which are, which are basically being formed by the smashing and bashing of lithospheric plates together. Whereas if you go to the surface of Venus here, you do not see the same sort of global dominance of continents all over the surface. And that tells us that while Venus certainly does seem to have volcanoes, you can see these little bumps here are probably sites of active volcanism. There's a volcano, there's a volcano. It does not have any of these global continents caused by plate tectonics. And this pro neither does Mars. Mars doesn't have any large scale continents like this as well. Continents, plate tectonics, that's an Earth thing. Another important thing that I'd like to show you is, uh, it's, it's very interesting to look at a picture of where most earthquakes are taking place. So if you go ahead and you measure earthquakes over the last hundred years, and earthquakes are going off all the time, every day. They don't always make the news unless they are extremely powerful or unless they cause some damage to uh, man, beast, or structure. But we can record the position using seismographs of earthquakes. And you'll notice that the earthquakes shown here as green dots over the last hundred years are not randomly crisscrossed or scattered across the surface of Earth but they're found in particular locations. They're found at the boundaries between lithospheric plates. And you can see Earth has maybe about 10 or 11 of these large plates that our lithosphere has been fractured into. As the plates get pushed around and jostle against each other like a game of bumper cars, they slam into each other sometimes directly um, uh, or slipping against one another, building up pressure and sending powerful vibrations through the, through the, uh, through the, the, the rock of Earth's lithosphere that create these uh, powerful earthquakes. For instance, I especially want to point out that we can see the Pacific Rim of Fire, where we see much of the world's volcanism, perfectly outlined here along the edge of the Pacific Ocean. Okay. Let's take a note or two about that so we have it in our notes. Oh. 
plate tectonics. Um, we could say that Earth, remember that plate tectonics are unique to Earth. Earth's lithosphere is fractured into a set of approximately 10, tilde 10 lithospheric plates. Um, these plates are pushed around on a so-called conveyor belt model by underlying mantle convection. And the convection is taking place, of course, in the asthenosphere. What are some of the results? Well, of course, some of the results include earthquakes. That's somewhat interesting. Um, we also form continents. Try to spell this. Um, we can form uh, mountain ranges. Mountains are a direct result of plate tectonics and erosion going hand in hand. Um, uh, we can form things called rift valleys. Rift valleys form where two parts of uh, the lithosphere are pulling away from each other, basically making a giant uh, depression. And there are some others as well. But these are some of the big ones to take away. These are the things that we're going to look for. We can also see um, tectonic cracks, tectonic rifts or cracks. Let's think about the global implications for a planet, which is what we're interested in when we look at other planets and compare them to Earth. You guys, of course, know about Pangea, right? What's the idea behind Pangea? It's like the supercontinent. Sorry, Lucas? It's like the continent that all the present continents broke off from. Right. So in other words, there's, uh, there's a reason why, students, that uh, South American, the continent of South America seems to fit into the continent of Africa like a jigsaw puzzle. I know jigsaw puzzles are popular these days with people who are bored in their homes, right? I can see all my friends doing, suddenly everyone's doing jigsaw puzzles. What the hell, what have we come to? Okay, anyways, um, it's the reason why the continent of South America seems to connect to the African uh, continent is because they were once connected in the supercontinent. But it's, it's not just that one supercontinent of Pangea. Over the course of, several different epochs, these continents and the, and the oceans crust that they're connected to. Remember, I don't want you guys to think something silly. Plate tectonics is not continents floating on the ocean. The, the, the continent of North America is connected to the ocean floor and North American plate, and South America is connected to a plate as well. But as these plates move around and as the continents grow and shrink from slamming into one another, they reform and rearrange themselves several times. One of our homework problems is gonna give us an estimate of the time scale for Earth to move these continents around. And basically, if you kind of measure the rate at which, con oh, that's something I wanted to put in our lecture here. In our lecture notes, I wanted to mention that the plates move with a velocity of something like one to three centimeters per year. Now that doesn't seem like very much. That's about the rate at which your fingernails grow. 
But the ticking by of years, remember that planetary time scales are much longer than people time scales, eventually cause the plates to move considerable distances. And sometimes you get added material from the seafloor spreading. I should probably put that in there as well. And uh, over geological time scales, over time scales of something like maybe 100 million years or so, which we can take the, as the definition of a geological time scale. So this is a geological time scale. The surface of Earth is basically repaved or, or reformed, however you want to say it. Basically, Earth is like a snake that's shedding its skin and reforming its surface every hundred million years. This is one of the reasons why craters don't stand a chance of sticking around very long on Earth, because uh, Earth is constantly smashing and building its surface uh, on top of itself and basically remolting its skin. <clears throat> Especially important to this would be places like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge along the Atlantic Ocean where we have a locus of seafloor spreading. So the way it works is you basically get underneath the oceans, you get some seafloor crust, right? You develop an underwater vent or crack in the lithosphere and convection begins pushing warm new material up up to the, the, the lower seawater sea pressure at the bottom of the ocean floor. And this warm lava basically crusts and solidifies and creates new seafloor. Now the surface area of Earth needs to remain constant. So every time you form some new crust up here on Earth, you have a subduction zone where older crust gets pushed down back into the mantle. So that Earth is constantly, basically exactly like a snake, molting its skin along these locuses of sea. And this whole thing is called seafloor spreading. It's kind of an important term in Earth geology. I don't know. I tried to draw a picture of this, but I don't know if I did a, a wonderful job or not. Let me share a screen with you. Uh, I think in my Earth lecture, I had a nice little picture of, of C4. Yeah, here, this is just a great diagram. This kind of drives the point home. I think that's 16. So <clears throat> this is one of the ways in which Earth is constantly reforming itself and shaping new continents. So we have locuses of C4 spreading where we're forming new oceanic crust. The oceanic crust gets pushed down underneath the continents. Of course, light materials like silicate rock, like sand, gets scraped up onto the continents and builds up continental landmass. And of course, those subduction zones will trigger volcanoes once they erupt. And uh, probably the most prominent structure of seafloor spreading is basically a long underwater volcano known as the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. The Mid-Atlantic Ridge is a pretty fascinating structure uh, on the surface of Earth. I think we have better explored the surface of the moon, whereas only maybe three or 4% of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge has been uh, explored by submersibles. Uh, there are most, you know, military submarines cannot get down to the depths of the ocean floor along the Atlantic Ocean. The ocean floor might be, I don't know, a couple miles, four kilometers or so. And I think, 2,000 kilometers is the average depth of, of some of our military submarines, but there are, are a number of special submersibles, submersibles that have been designed to, to get down to the bottom of the ocean floor. One of them, of course, um, is the Deep Sea Alvin, run out of Woods Hole. The original Alvin sphere uh, has now been retired. 
this is actually kind of cool. So they designed these sub these submersibles that could go down to the bottom of the ocean floor and explore along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Here's the original Alvin, the DSV Alvin uh, 1, uh, shown in 1978. That's the year I was born. Holy smokes. And this thing was making some of the first exploration uh, of the deep sea floor. Today, it's been replaced by the deep sea Alvin 2. And it gets dropped off. I wonder if they have a, uh, a Wikipedia page for this. A buddy of mine named Jefferson, he's the pilot for the deep sea Alvin 2. So I got to take a field trip one day over to Woods Hole, and he let me sit inside the submersible and, and listen to some heavy metal on his stereo system. And he talked about taking these uh, you know, multi-hour excursions down to the bottom of the sea floor. It was absolutely amazing. So the DSV Alvin 2 is our newest exploring submarine. Um, oh, I guess it's on the same page. Anyways, I don't know if you guys know the story about what happens when you go down into the bottom of the ocean. At first, um, I was just looking for a modern picture of it. Here we go. Isn't there like that marine snow with like all the, the bones and shit from all the fish who have died? Yeah. And the just fall down. So, so Lucas, that's something I wanted to talk about. In most places on the ocean floor, the, the surface, the, the bottom of the ocean is as devoid of life as the surface of the moon. And that's because ultimately most organisms on Earth are connected to the solar food chain, right? Now hear me out on this about the solar food chain. The idea is you eat the burger, right? And then, sorry, I'm just trying to get to gallery view so I can see you guys. You eat a burger, the cow eats the grass, and the grass eats the sunlight. So in a way, you're eating sunlight and you're connected to the solar food chain. And so are many of the ocean organisms. I think sunlight can only penetrate down to a depth of about a mile or so before extinction basically blocks out all the sunlight. So at the top of the ocean, you have cyanobacteria and photosynthetic organisms that, that can absorb sunlight and you have fish that like whales and things that eat them. You have other fish that eat other fish. And as you get deeper into the ocean, it's kind of a Darwinian arms race of which fish can eat this other fish. But I think after about a kilometer or two, you enter something called the dead zone, where the pressures are too high and there's just not enough sunlight or not enough organisms for any living life to exist. And by the time you get to the bottom of the ocean floor, it's completely devoid of life, except it is covered in this so-called marine snow, which are little bits of fishy bits that kind of are floating down from all the fish eating each other. It's kind of like the you know, fish skin cells or whatever that are, that are populating the bottom of the ocean. When the original deep sea Alvin and some of the early explorers made it down to the bottom of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, they expected to also find absolutely no life there. And that's because not only were they four kilometers down at the bottom of the ocean, far from any sunlight, but also near some of these underwater ridges, which are basically like little underwater volcanoes, the temperatures can get as high as 1,200 degrees Celsius. And the water is literally boiling along these so-called black smokers. Let's see if we can find a picture here of the black smokers. Um, I sh yeah, okay. So basically, these are these sort of places where the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is basically having volcanic outgassing and lava coming up and forming these structures right along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. The crazy thing they discovered when they got to these hydrothermal vents is that rather, being com rather than being completely devoid of organisms, there was a whole chain of sea life going on down along these hydrothermal vents. And these are what are now called hydrothermal vent communities. Some of you may have seen this in a nature show because they're kind of exotic and cool. Probably one of the most famous iconic organisms to be recorded along the hydrothermal vents are these so-called giant tube worms, these alien looking tentacle stalks that have these beautiful red tongues that are coming out. Now, if you even try to take one of these organisms up to the surface at sea level pressure, they immediately just disintegrate into a blob of jelly 
because they are designed to exist under immense sea pressures. But when they studied these so-called giant tube worms, they discovered that the giant tube worms were eating these bacteria and the bacteria were actually surviving by eating sulfur from the volcanic outgassing. And the implication of this was pretty profound. If these giant tube worms are eating bacteria that are eating sulfur from volcanic outgassing, and here you can see there are some sea anemones here, and there's also some giant crab, some weird looking sh shrimpy crabs. Uh, let me see if I have a picture here in my planetary. So they're not part of the solar chain food chain? Th that's right. That's, that's exactly what I'm saying, Lucas. They're totally devoid, they're totally outside the solar food chain. In fact, if you think about what's going on, so I tried to find some of my favorite diagrams of them. So here was a mass of just sort of translucent crabs that were clustered along there. They have some weird sea anemones and some shrimpies. This, these were some translucent shrimp. Remember, it's pitch dark down here. And I think one of the nice diagrams that I found is, this is a nice professional grade diagram of, of what a hydrothermal vent is kind of like. You've got, notice it's very much like a volcano. You've got a magma chamber, which is at 1200 degrees Celsius. Okay, maybe I exaggerated the temperatures a bit. Uh, the, the, the vent is pulling up materials into these so-called black smokers. And here you can see the temperature of the water is maybe 350 degrees Celsius. So keep in mind, that's well over the boiling point of water. This is boiling water here. This is the same water you cook your ramen in. And there are all these organisms eating the sulfur. And then there's these biospheres that are completely independent of the solar food chain. Basically, these are aliens on Earth that are eating the geothermal energy from underneath Earth's lithosphere. And believe it or not, scientists who've begun trying to sample these hydrothermal vents to the best of their ability have discovered that the bacteria actually are found all the way down into these vents. And there may actually be a potential biomass of organisms underneath the lithosphere of Earth that exceeds the total biomass of organisms at the surface of Earth. It's possible that most of the life on Earth is underneath the lithosphere, just geothermal alien bacteria that have just been percolating down there for billions of years. We might actually kind of be the offshoot. In fact, most people believe this is how life on Earth would have originated because early Earth was not at all amenable to the living organisms we have today. There was not a strong atmosphere of oxygen for land organisms to breathe. We didn't have an ultraviolet ozone shield. Probably life began down there along hydrothermal vents and slowly seeped its way up to the surface. That's very exciting because if life can exist underneath the lithosphere of Earth, just think about what kind of creepy crawlers might be out there on some of these other volcanically active planets and moons in our solar system. We just don't have the means yet of sampling them. So this is very exciting. I, there's another reason why I'm telling you this story, and that's because we're going to see a similar sort of thing going on on one of Jupiter's moons, Europa. And I don't want to spoil the punchline yet, but let's just say that there's more likely to be life on Europa than there is on the surface of Mars. Okay, before I completely blow in this day and screw it up, um, let's do one last thing. I think I've got time just to say a couple of very fast words about erosion. And then I will have covered all of my four geological processes, and I can feel good about myself. Uh, just a moment here, class. OK. Um, let me get back to my slideshow. And let's take a look at some sand dunes. Erosion is a powerful force that can significantly shape the surfaces of planets in a very, very short time scale. And I don't know what desert this is, if these, this is from the Sahara Desert, but you can see that these wind sculpted dunes are an example of wind erosion. Wind erosion is a, is a powerful form of erosion that's every bit as potent as water erosion and erosion from ice and glaciers. So a full discussion of erosion requires us to get into planetary atmospheres, which I'll tackle next class. But for now, let's take these simple notes. There are basically three to four forms of erosion that we see around our solar system. 
One of the most important is wind erosion. Wind erosion is found on Earth, on Mars, and even on some Jovian moons. Well, we'll leave that off to the side for a second. But let's say Earth and Mars both have active wind erosion. Weirdly, Venus, because of its lack of rotation, Venus has no wind erosion. In fact, Venus doesn't have any erosion of any type, which is kind of strange since it has the thickest atmosphere. Wind erosion is capable of sculpting these beautiful dunes and chipping away at rock structures. They're called yardangs. And yardangs are a telltale sign. I love that word, yardangs. A, tel a tel telltale sign of wind erosion. They are wind sculpted dunes. Let me try to draw a slightly better picture of a yard end. It's okay. It's a wind sculpted dune. We see yard dangs on Earth and we see yard dangs on Mars. Really quickly, let me just 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 for the fun of it. Let's see what happens when we type yardangs into the Mr. Google here. Yardangs. So here's a picture of yardangs, some wind sculpted dunes. You see them in the Sahara Desert, you see them all over Earth, and you can see them all over Mars as well. Wind is a powerful erosional force. Wind, of course, picks up little bits of fine grit and sand and can sandblast the surfaces of rocks. Have you guys ever heard of a dirt devil before? You know what that is? Okay, neither did I. When I was 18 years old, I went to college and I was a Rhode Islander, grew up here just like you guys or most of you. And I, I took my first trip to college out west to Arizona. And as an 18 year old punk kid, I had my, all my belongings in a little suitcase, a little trunk. And I took the plane to Phoenix, Arizona and got on a shuttle bus taking me through the desert down to Tucson, Arizona, where I was gonna to go to school. And one of the first things I saw, looking out the window of the shuttle bus, uh, was this thing called a dirt devil. And I wanna show you guys a picture of it because I had never seen anything like this in my life. And this is, this is kind of just what it was like. We're driving along in the shuttle bus here. Sometimes they call them a dust devil. And I look out the shuttle bus window. Okay, let's, why can't I click on anything? What the hell's going on here? All right, here we go. Whoa. Sorry, there's some kind of. This is exactly what it looked like. I looked out the window and I saw this little funnel of dust blowing across the desert. And there was an old cowboy sitting next to me. He had a 10 gallon hat on. I said, is that a tornado? And he went, that there, son, is a dirt devil. And I said, well, what the hell is a dirt devil? He said, I'll tell you what, son, I wouldn't want to get caught in one of those things if I were you. It'll take the, the, the skin off your face and the paint off your car. And I said, well, Jesus, is it dangerous? He's like, only if you get caught in it. And I was like, all right, well, let's get moving then. I don't want to get caught in no dirt devil. <laughs> and I'd never seen anything like it. I'd, you know, they're just like a small atmospheric phenomenon. Um, they can have powerful effects on erosion because and I guess, you know, some of you guys are veterans. Maybe you've served uh, out in, in Afghanistan or Iraq. And I guess uh, the uh, soldiers who've served out there are very familiar with these because they're quite common in Iraq. You have these powerful dust storms that just blanket everything you can see. So I guess growing up in Rhode Island, we're a little bit sheltered for some of these wind phenomenons. Here's a beautiful picture of one of those dirt devils. He's a little funnel here. All that little dust and grit that it's covering can sandblast you. Now, let me show you this cool picture uh, from the surface of Mars that you guys might get a kick out of. I want to show you two photographs of Mars um, that were both taken with the Hubble Space Telescope about a month apart. F5, slide 107. This is, oh, shoot. This is an image of Mars taken June 26, 2001. And you can see many of the surface features on Mars that we're about to look at in our lab, including the ice caps and some of the volcanoes and the Valles Marineris. 
And then literally one month later, in September, you can't see any of the surface features. And that's because the entire planet of Mars is basically being coated in a planet-wide dirt devil. This is a planet-wide dust storm that's covering the entire planet at once. Imagine a storm that covered every single square foot of the surface of Earth. That would be the most epic storm that were to ever rage on our planet. And Mars is constantly going through these global dust storms. All of that dust and grit blasting around the surface can shape the surfaces of the planets over long periods of time. So I just wanted to mention that, of course, wind is a powerful form of erosion. Now, I'm pretty much out of time, so I'm just going to slap down some of the others, and we'll talk about it in another light. Obviously, water is a powerful form of erosion, whether it be rain or snow. Um, think about the erosion of the, the Grand Canyon caused by the Colorado River. Ice is a form of erosion in the form of glaciers, which carve out mountains and valleys, dragging boulders along with them. And in the outer solar system, we see these things that I'll talk about later called frost jets. And you see frost jets often on Jovian moons. These are moons that don't have an atmosphere per se, but will occasionally have sublimation where ice goes directly into a gas phase. The gas blows across the surface, which basically creates a form of wind erosion, but then it freezes back onto the surface. So sometimes you can have wind erosion even when there's no atmosphere, which is pretty amazing. Obviously, erosion changes and it wears down the surfaces of the planets. Okay. At this point, it would be nice for us to put our knowledge of the four geological forces into practice. And that's precisely what we are going to do by taking an intricate look at the surface history of Mars by playing planetary Sherlock Holmes. Uh, there's lots more I could have said about this class, but I'm out of time, so I'm gonna leave it there. Um, let me tell you what materials you're gonna need for our lab before we take a, uh, a quick break for iced tea. Um, <clears throat> Let me go to gallery view with you guys. Uh, I've provided for you, right in your lab handout for today, all the materials you're going to need. Well, almost all of them. Um, let's just go to Blackboard real quick together. Exit out of here. Um, let's get rid of my dirt devils and my yardangs and my tube worms. Uh, lab. I set this up for you guys last night, so if you haven't checked in a while. Lab 11, Landscapes of Mars. Not only did I give you the lab handout, but I'm also, we're going to be using this Mars topographical map. And this Mars MOLA map is a high resolution picture of the surface of Mars. And we're going to explore that together. So download your map and download your, your Landscapes of Mars handout. And it might be nice if you have a ruler, a ruler with centimeters on it so we can measure some of these structures. Uh, I guess that might be a little awkward since it's on your screen, but we'll figure it out. Especially if you can open this thing up um, in Adobe Reader on your screens, that would be nice. Let's see, what did I do with that? Uh, am I black terabyte? Astronomy 1010 Labs. I'm gonna I'm gonna actually open up the topographical map right here in uh, in Adobe Reader. That way I can use the magnifying tool and I can kind of zoom in and kind of pull my way around. Normally, uh, when we do this in our labs at school, I actually have physical copies of these maps, which is a real believe it or not, it's such a nice luxury to be able to work with the physical map itself because then it's kind of spread out in front of you. But times being what they are, we'll have to make do with the digital version, which is the same thing really. Um, so why don't you get those out? We'll take a few minutes for iced tea and a little after one, we'll get started. Does that sound like a plan? 
Okay. Any questions before I stop the recording? All right, I'm gonna stop the recording.